Hey there, welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. I'm Jessica Honiger, founder of the world-changing brand Noonday Collection. We gather here for direct and honest conversations that help you live a life of courage by leaving comfort and going scared. And we are in the middle of our celebration of 2 million downloads. Thanks to you, our Going Scared listeners. To honor those 2 million downloads and to celebrate you, we are doing a listener favorites countdown. And today is number eight from the vault and for sure is one of my personal favorites. Dr. Lori Santos, she studies happiness and is the host of the super popular podcast, The Happiness Lab. She will share her insights on the science of happiness, including some surprising research findings about what actually makes us happy. I have learned so much from her podcast. And what I love about it is, yes, she was a professor at Yale. She is a researcher. She is a scientist, but she's super pragmatic and practical and just gives a lot of reminders about these very basic things like comparing ourselves to others, um, thinking that we'll be happier if we could just get fill in the blank. She really dispels so many myths that there are around happiness and it provides some really pragmatic ways to honestly just learn contentment because that's what I think about happiness. To me, happiness is contentment. Since I interviewed Dr. Lori Santos, she is taking her a break from her role as a professor at Yale to work on her podcast. The Happiness Lab is now in its sixth season, and she also just developed a new high school version of her free online happiness class for teens. She told us that since our podcast aired, that she's learned even more about the importance of practicing what she preaches so she doesn't burn out. So she took a break as being a professor at Yale um, because COVID was a really tough time on campus and she's now harnessing her new strategies more than ever. Well, whether you're feeling stuck in a rut or just looking to add a little more happiness to your life, you're not going to want to miss this episode with Dr. Lori Santos. Let's dive in. And I don't say this very often, but I hardly listen to podcasts because I have no commute to work. I do group exercise. I have three kids and I'm running a business. So, (laughs) but I love your podcast and especially this last year as an entrepreneur, I've been on this journey of letting go of the myth that there is a point of arrival. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so your interview with Michelle Kwan, I mean, I like, I just broke down. I was like in tears, like just, and so I wanted to know if I can take you back in time a little bit, because I know it's been a hot second since you did interview her, but tell me, because I know you are a fan of hers now too. Tell me what you learned about interviewing Michelle. Yeah, well, first, I mean, it was just such an amazing opportunity to get to talk to to, to her, you know, I mean, I, I remember watching her skate, you know, back in the day. And so when I found out she was, she was coming for a talk on Yale's campus. And so when I found out she was coming, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get her for the podcast interview in part because I had known, you know, about this story where, you know, she, she had like the gold medal in some sense, like ripped from her, but was just so kind of like beautiful about it. And just like was able to just kind of take that moment and make it just even more beautiful. And so, so I was super excited to talk to her. Um, I don't, I don't know where you do your podcast recordings, but mine are in my house in a closet. And so I had to invite the Michelle Kwan into my closet, which is filled with a bunch of mattresses. And I'm like, I know this is not really a proper recording studio. But, that but makes me was, love you. That makes me love you, Lori. <laughs> like, I know you're kind of really famous, but, um, but yeah, so completely unflappable, just sat down in my closet with a bunch of mattresses, you know, and we just got started. And, you know, I think I, I knew her story, but kind of hearing her tell it just made it so clear, you know think what she was skating for wasn't the medals. It was just this process of just loving the grind. You know, she loved being on the ice. You know, she talked about skating over the Olympic rings and that bringing her to tears. And it just became clear that she wasn't doing this for the accolades. She was doing it because she loved it. And and that was why she was so great at it. You know, that was why she derived happiness from it, even in the face of, you know, what for most athletes would be just kind of an awful moment. Um, You know, she was just able to sail through it. 
Well, it's funny that you describe this as an awful moment because in your podcast, you talk about and the research that's been done that says that you're actually happier if you get a bronze medal as opposed to a silver. And Michelle has, she won a silver and then I believe a bronze in two Olympics. And Tell us a little bit about that phenomenon and why is that so? Yeah, well, it's kind of a puzzle, right? Because, you know, you, you, when you, if you watch the Olympics or you watch any kind of sporting event, you know, groups that do like incredibly well and are second best in the world are often like really unhappy when they find that news out. You know, silver medalists in general on the stand are incredibly unhappy looking, not just kind of less happy than the gold medalists, but actively showing emotional expressions of disgust, anger, you know, sadness and so on, which is kind of, you know, weird in the sense that they're a second in the world. What's even more puzzling is that if you look at the expressions of the bronze medalists, they tend to be incredibly happy. I mean, in some cases, they look happier than the gold medalist, which is weird because they're even in objectively worse off than the silver medalist. And so the question is sort of what's going on. And so what the research shows us is that what's going on is that we as humans don't evaluate things objectively in terms of, you know, objectively how we're doing. We're gold, we're silver, we're bronze, you know, we're first, second, or third. We always evaluate relative to some reference point. You know, there's somebody else that we're comparing ourselves against And that's how we measure how well we did. And for the silver medalists, it's obvious who they're measuring themselves against. You know, they almost got gold, you know, and so when they think about how well they did, they can't help but compare and feel like a loser, you know, and that's where the sadness, the anger, you know, the disappointment comes from. Bronze medalists, in contrast, have a different comparison point. You know, they weren't going to beat the gold medalists. You know, there are multiple people, in, you know, in between them, right? But they g- think that, you know, this, you know, a few seconds off and they could have been not on the stand at all. You know, they, by just a cinch, they ended up getting a medal. And that wasn't necessarily a foregone conclusion given the way it went. And so they're ecstatic. You know, their reference point is kind of making them happy. And so, you know, this is, you know, fun if you care about Olympic medalists and Michelle Kwan and things like that. But this is the kind of thing we do all the time. You know, objectively, we can do be doing incredibly well in our businesses and our work. But then, you know, if somebody else is doing just a little bit better, now all of a sudden we feel sad. You know, objectively, our vacation can be fantastic, you know, but if we peek on Facebook and somebody looks like they're doing better, all of a sudden now we feel terrible. And so this idea of social comparison really can rob us of our happiness um, unless we find ways to overcome that. And really, and this is one of the reasons I really love talking to Michelle, she was really able to do that in her own way by kind of loving the grind. You know, it wasn't about comparing herself against someone else. It wasn't even about the medals. It was just that like she loved what she was doing. And so she didn't need a comparison. And I think that was my big takeaway. I mean, I... I thought I'd come really far in this, okay? I have written a book and a big piece of it was her success doesn't diminish yours. And I speak a lot to women. I talk a ton about comparison. I'm 10 years in now to leading a really successful business, but we did not reach our sales goals and we missed them by a pretty big mark. And I saw it as such a failure. And I did, I got out of touch with the love of the game, you know, and the love of the practices, the love of the activities. And I think that's why hearing you interview Michelle was so powerful to me. But I think I'm pretty, you know, an enlightened person. I've done some work, therapy, executive coaching, mm-hmm. and yet I still get tripped up. And you are the director of Yale's Comparative Cognition Laboratory. So let's talk a little bit more about comparison because you also can talk about the benefits of comparison. So share with us a little bit about comparison cognition and what is it and why do you study it? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, one of the things we know from studying how social comparison works is that you can know that all these phenomena are going on, but that doesn't necessarily shut them off. And this is true for social comparison. It's true for lots of the ways our mind works. You know, you can know the kinds of things that you're supposed to be doing right and know that these phenomena exist but that doesn't necessarily make them go away. And and that sucks, you know, like it sucks to be, you know, in some sense, an expert on some of these biases and still fall prey to them myself. You know, I'm going to feel just as bad about my vacation, you know, if I scroll through someone else's Instagram, you know, I'm going to feel just as bad about my bikini pics, you know, when I see Beyonce and her bikini, right? Like, that's just the way minds work, even if you know. And so I think that's kind of the puzzle. I mean, for people like us and, and who, you know, know this work and have gotten this kind of training, it's still really hard. You still have to put a lot of work in to find strategies to get around this stuff. Um, and I think that that's, you know, really important message for folks to hear. I mean, sometimes folks think like, oh, you know, I'll hear this Michelle pod- 
I'll hear this Michelle Kwan podcast and then all of a sudden, you know, I'll just be good. But actually that's not really the case. It's just, just going to keep taking work to avoid the comparison. And that's kind of just what the research suggests. Well, it's crazy because after listening to your interview, that was one of my big takeaways of Michelle's strategy is to, so you got to love the practices, like the grind. I mean, she, you know, you've got to love, she, she just practice and she loves skating and she talked about the joy. She could even remember the audience and what the audience sounded like. Like her big takeaway um, from the Olympics was not like, that was my moment to get gold and I will forever never hold a gold medal. But it was really about the experience because she just loves skating. And I ended up rearranging my whole work schedule. And I went on this big tour of the East Coast to go meet up with all of our stakeholders, which we call Noonday Collection Ambassadors, and just to get back in touch with the love of what I do, the love of entrepreneurship. What are some other strategies that are helpful if you fall prey to comparison? Well, I think one is is taking a different comparison point, right? I mean, what the research shows is that our minds can't shut off comparison necessarily, But we can definitely pick which comparison points we're paying attention to. Um, You know, in the podcast, we joke about finding a bronze lining. You know, if you're the silver medalist, you're looking to gold. But if you're the bronze medalist, you know, you're feeling pretty good, even though you didn't objectively do that well. And I think we can all do that in our lives. I think we have this natural tendency to compare against, you know, the best people out there or our personal best performance. You know, if you had a bad sales period, you're comparing it against some uh, you know, some sales period where you did really fantastic. You know, if you're thinking about how good your vacation is, you're not comparing it against some mediocre vacation. You're comparing it against the best vacation you could imagine. But we don't necessarily have to do that. And the fact of the matter is, is that there's lots of comparison points out there that make us look pretty good. You know, I think we can do this a lot when it comes to salary and income. You know, one of the main reasons that we feel like we're not making enough money is that we're constantly bombarded by you know, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and the rich people we see on TV and on social media. Like if you actually look at what real people earn, sometimes you can say, wait, hang on. Like I was feeling bad before, but now this is actually something that can make me feel better. And so I think finding those comparisons that aren't necessarily the best of the best of the best, but like what real people are doing, you know, real body, real salaries, real vacations, real sales performances, like that can actually make you feel better. A second thing you can do is not to necessarily look to real people, Um, But to do an imaging visualization where you think about what life would be like without that sort of thing. And this is a tendency, this is a a practice that researchers call negative visualization. Um, It's kind of like the, it's a wonderful life phenomenon. You know, like if you think back to the, you know, famous Christmas movie, it's, you know, what would my life be like if I just wasn't there? But we could do that for anything. You know, what would life be like, you know, if I didn't have this job opportunity at all? Or what would life be like if I didn't have this vacation at all? I didn't have my spouse, didn't have my kids. Like you can quickly do that fast negative visualization and it causes you to have a lot of gratitude. I mean, basically what you're doing is you're setting up a comparison point that's in some sense, you know, really bad. You know, what would life be like if I didn't have this job at all? Now, all of a sudden, just the act of having the job, even if it's going badly, you're like, this is great. I can't, you know, I'm so grateful for having this there. And so we can use the power of imagery to set up our own comparison points. And that can sometimes make us kind of remember how grateful we are for the things we really do have. It can kind of shut off that comparison. Do you find that there's certain types of people that struggle with this more than others in your research? Yeah, and there are definitely data suggesting that people, people there's some people who are prone to fall prey to this even more than some others, right? Um, and in fact, there's measures of social comparison that you can get. And research shows that folks who uh, are on social media kind of get more of a hit from being on social media if you're prone to social comparison than if you're not. And I think, you know, you don't necessarily need a scientific instrument to measure this, right? You know, you can tell if you're the kind of person who, you know, really pays a lot of attention to other people, you know, do you, do you pay attention to your own grind? Or are you the kind of person who really, you know, feels it when other people are doing slightly better than you? You know, do you get the little green eyed monster, right? You know, if you're that kind of person, you might need these strategies even more than someone else who's, who's not as prone to this tendency. Let's talk, you brought up salary and money. And I love that because you do a whole podcast talking about, you know, 
the, the one of the guys who wins the lottery and I think ends up committing suicide. And, you know, your whole thesis is there is there is a threshold of happiness and we over project usually this point of arrival. We think we have point of arrivals in our mind, whether it's our weight, when I finally weigh that, when I can finally fit into those jeans, when I can finally earn that salary, when I finally land that boyfriend and we over project how happy that's going to make us. And yet we under project our ability to go through hard things. Tell us a little bit about that because that whole point really stuck with me. Yeah. And so, so much of our happiness isn't, you know, something that when we think about happiness, we're often projecting things, right? This is how we make decisions. You know, when you decide whether or not to take a certain job or whether or not to go on a certain vacation or whether or not to date a certain person, you're often making those decisions using some prediction about your own happiness. You know, will this dating this person make me happy? Will this job make me happier than my current job? And so on. The problem is that what research shows is that a lot of the way we go about making those predictions, those mechanisms kind of suck. Like they're just really inaccurate. And one of the things that's inaccurate about them is that we tend to over project how good things are going to feel and over project how bad things are going to feel, both in terms of their intensity and in terms of their duration. You know, so take a good thing, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a promotion at work or, or I'll use the example you use, you know, I'm going to fit in those jeans finally, I'm going to lose that last 15 pounds and finally fit in those jeans. Like we, when we project how good that's going to feel, we think the intensity is going to be huge, right? It's going to just be, feel so amazing. And we also think the duration is going to feel huge. You know, once I fit in those jeans, like everything else, you know, for the rest of life, hunky dory, I'm just great, you know, <laughs> but, but it turns out we're wrong on both counts. It doesn't feel as good as we think. And it definitely, that good feeling doesn't last for as long as we think. And that means that sometimes we put these, these good events in our lives up there, like, you know, I'm going to just keep my life on hold till I reach this happiness point of, you know, the perfect genes or the perfect job or the perfect relationship. And in practice, once we get there, we're not going to be as happy as we think. That's kind of the bad news. But, but the same phenomena gives us some good news, which is that, you know, there are things that we think, oh my gosh, if this happened in my life, my life would be over right now. You know, if I, you know, lost a, lost a child or lost a spouse or got fired from my job or, you know, had a, had a really bad sales quarter, right? We, we are making predictions about how awful those events would feel, but those predictions are also off in terms of their intensity and in terms of their duration. Um, we have all these mechanisms that kind of kick in to make ourselves feel okay even in the worst of circumstances. And we also have brains that find meaning in things that are really bad. You know, again, even in the worst of circumstances. And so in the podcast, we talk to people who've both had these awesome good things happen, like win the lottery or, or just, just absolutely terrible things happen, like you know, losing limbs in a car accident or you know, get, getting an incurable disease. And in all these cases, what you find is what we would predict from the outside, you know, this would be fantastic or this would destroy my life. Those predictions simply are wrong. And that is, you know, important for the good stuff. It means we shouldn't be out there, you know, throwing our all into pursuing these things, given that it's not going to give us the happiness we think. We, at least we should be more realistic about what those achievements are going to feel like. But I think it gives us an even clearer glimpse into the fact that we're just going to be more resilient when the bad stuff comes up. You know, when the breakups happen, you know, when we get bad news at work, when we get bad health news, it's not actually going to be as bad as we think. Our resilience is going to kick in much more than we expect. And the mindset, what do you think it's costing us? That mindset that when we get to this point of arrival, it's going to equal A, B, C, and D. What is that costing us? Well, I think the cost is that when we kind of get in those mindsets, what happens is that when we finally achieve the thing, we're off in terms of our prediction of happiness. So, so let's take, you know, the jeans example. You know, when I finally lose the 15 pounds, I fit in these jeans, it's going to feel amazing. You know, there's that one morning you put them on. And it feels good, but maybe not as good as you expect. And what that means is instead of realizing like, wait, hang on, my prediction was off. What we think is I need to double down. You know, maybe I need to lose another five or, you know, maybe I need to fit into these other genes that I'm just simply never, ever going to fit into. Right. I think what happens is when we don't get the result we want, it's not that we throw away the enterprise. We kind of double down on that, that next accolade, that next thing. And I think the domain we see this most in, in the, in the kind of business world for all the women who are kind of listening to this podcast is in the context of salary. You know, we think if, as soon as I achieve a certain salary level or a certain level of success at work, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be happy. And then that doesn't happen. And we're like, oh, wait, maybe it's not that success level. Maybe it's like one higher that I have to achieve. I have to do more, more, more. And then we do more and then that doesn't work. And then we think, well, I, I still need more, you know? And so I guess two things there. One is that we, we end up continually 
kind of going after this stuff that's not going to work. But in the face of it not working, then we double down. And that means we're constantly on this, you know, treadmill of pursuit of things that aren't going to give us the happiness we expect. So what gives us happiness? How do you define happy? Yeah, well, this is, a, it comes from the research, right? And and one of the things that the research tells us is that the things that really make us happy, that really give us long-standing happiness, happiness that's going to stick, they're not often the things we think. It's not, you know, the money and the shiny accolades. Uh, it's It's different stuff. And so one of the things the research suggests does really bring happiness is social connection like taking time to have truly meaningful social connection with other people. And that can be your friends and family members. It can be, you know, a barista at a coffee shop. If you really take time to talk to that person and make connections, happy people tend to have these deep, meaningful social relationships. And, you know, this, again, we kind of know this, but, but what's scary is that we often put those things on hold when we're prioritizing the other stuff, you know, like time at work, you know, time to like, you know, be at the gym to perfect our bodies. Like, you know, those are the things that we often can, can, can be prioritizing. And that means we're putting on hold some time with the people we care about. And from a happiness perspective, that's kind of an error. Um, another thing the work on happiness suggests can bring us again, more well being than we think is taking time to be other oriented. And I think this is a mistake we make a lot in the present environment. You know, right now we're in the midst of the the holiday season, we're about to enter the new year. And like every magazine you look at, it's like self-care, you know, treat yourself, like put yourself first, like self, self, self. But the research on happiness suggests that that might not be the best strategy. In fact, Research shows that happier people tend to be other oriented. In other words, they're kind of worried about helping others. You know, they want to volunteer more. They want to donate more of their money to charity rather than buy stuff for themselves. They tend not to be as focused on themselves. And again, you know, this is something that we just don't predict. Like it's just kind of countercultural to say, you know, I'm having a bad day at work, you know, rather than get myself a really nice latte or a manicure, I'm going to gift a coworker a really nice latte or a manicure. I mean, the research shows that that would make us happier, but it's kind of not the strategy we think. Um, the final thing I think that's really tough about happiness and that we that's like tough, especially for busy working professionals, is that happier people tend to prioritize their free time. Um, happier people have what researchers call time affluence, this idea that you just feel wealthy in time. Um, you know, it's a very foreign concept to me. Um, it's one, you know, I, I more often feel what researchers call time famine, where you're literally famished for time. Um, but again, you know, we think the route to happiness is like pack your schedule, like pack, pack, pack more and more and more and more meetings, more stuff, more accolades. But actually the research suggests it's just the opposite. It's having some time to breathe. Um, it's, you know, maybe canceling some of those meetings to have some time off just to have a break. Again, not what we expect, but it's what the research shows. Oh my gosh, that's the story of my life right now because my big goal for 2020 is to take control of my schedule and I realize I need more free time to feel creative and present and yet I feel really selfish about carving out just random free time during my work day. I don't have any problem like self-care. Actually, you're like self-care. I'm like, I love a good Manny. I mean, I don't know if it makes me happy. It definitely makes me happier when I take a friend and treat her who can't really afford it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I love that. That is like double happiness for me. But I wonder where does that come from? This idea of I mean, I love that research actually shows that, what did you call it? Time wealth? Time affluence. So it's like, yeah, it's like wealthy time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, how do we, how do we get a mindset of time affluence? It's really hard. I mean, it's hard for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, as I said, our minds, the, the whole theme of our podcast is this idea that our minds lie to us about the sorts of things that make us happy. You know, our minds think pack the schedule, that's going to do it, you know, more and more and more, right? But turns out our minds are just wrong. I think in this case, our culture is wrong too, you know, especially, you know, I'm here at Yale University where I see these elite college students, like, you know, they can't not pack it in. And in fact, when they don't have stuff on their schedule, they almost get anxious. You know, their first reaction to a little time affluence is to kind of, you know, freak out about like, you know, what am I doing wrong? It's, it's almost like a status signal that you're doing something wrong, that you're lesser than the people who have really packed schedules. Um, so I think we have these cultural influences telling us, you know, more, 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 fill the schedule. But in practice, that's just not going to work in the way we think. And so I think this, the steps that we need to take to become more time affluent is first to realize that this is a problem, to realize that this is actually a hit to our happiness and we'd be better off if we took some time off. 
And then I think it's just to really, I mean, like all good things, it, it, you got to schedule it. You literally have to schedule the empty time, um, you know, both in your workday and I think in your personal life. I mean, literally go into your like GCAL and like block off times, you know, get right time affluence. And I think when you get there, I mean, first of all, you just feel so free. I mean, I imagine you've had the same experience I do when, you know, you think you, your schedule is packed and you have meetings all day and you get to some meeting and the meeting was canceled and all of a sudden uh, you have a free hour. And it's like, fast. It's, you feel amazing. And it feels like much more than a real hour, you know, just a single hour. And I think that's, that's actually one of the important things about time affluence. It's not the objective amount of free time you have. It's the amount of free time you feel like you have. And that means that, you know, we can work on our perception of our time in ways that can make us feel more time affluent that don't necessarily require a lot of actual free time. One thing researchers talk about is sort of, you know, reframing the perks in your life um, as giving you more time. You know, so the next time you take out, you know, get some takeout, don't just frame it as like, oh, I'm getting takeout. Frame it as like, you know, this is, I'm doing this to like save myself some time. You know, if I had to cook this pad thai on the stove, it'd take like, you know, at least an hour and a half. You know, now I don't have to do that. That's a free hour and a half I have for something else. It's just a simple reframing, but the act of doing that can make you feel like, oh my gosh, I have lots of free time. Um, I tell this to a lot of managers who work with employees. You know, there's so many companies now where, you know, they give employees food and so on. And I'm like, reframe that to them as not just like, you know, it's a nice company culture, but like, you know, this is a way to give you some free time. You know, when you get home, you can like, you know, you don't have to pack your lunch because you're going to have it here. And again, just that simple reframing can cause people to realize like, oh my gosh, like I have an extra hour. I didn't realize. Now you feel time affluent and you get the sort of well-being boost that comes with it. One of my favorite interviews on my podcast, Going Scared, was with Rich Carlgaard, who is the publisher of Forbes. And he wrote a book called Late Bloomer, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. And I'm curious because you, and we talk a lot about that, what you're saying your Yale students are like, pack it in, more achievement, more activities, more gold stars. How does your work on happiness apply to those who are suffering from anxiety and depression and the like? And do you feel like, has there been an, what has increased depression and anxiety among young people? And then how is your work as a professor at Yale kind of influencing mental illness on your campus? Yeah, I mean, this was the reason I got into it, honestly. I'm, I'm a head of college here at Yale, which means I live on campus with students. I'm like the faculty presence in the dorms, basically. And so I see all these mental health crises up close and personal. I mean, it's tragic, right? The, this question of like why these things are increasing, I mean, it's in some ways, it's the million dollar question. We know that these things are increasing and they're increasing at staggering rates. It's not just about stigma going down. It's not just about people reporting more. Like we know that these things are going up. I mean, just one recent statistic among young people, people under 30, is that uh, depression rates among people under 30 have doubled in the last nine years, uh, which is like incredibly sad and crazy. But we don't really totally know what's going on. Um, that's the honest answer. There's probably lots. I mean, can you correlate though? Like in the last 10 years is when the iPhone came out. Well, and I mean, this is what I was going to say, right? Is that, you know, there's, there's little causal data on this stuff, but you know, there is one striking correlation that you brought up, you know, especially nine years, like hmm, what happened nine years uh -huh. ago? With, like, you know, um, these devices that we all have in our pockets. Um, it's incredibly hard to do good research on whether those types of things are affecting us because nobody, there's no one around that doesn't have an iPhone or if they don't have an iPhone, they're kind of weird, you know, <laughs> it's like kind of not socially representative for other reasons. Um, but there's lots of reasons to suspect that tech might be hurting us in ways that we don't expect. I mean, one reason is that tech is really hurting our sleep. Something else we know is really important for well-being, And this is especially true among young people. Um, you know, I think that the recent statistic I heard was that the percentage of 15 year olds who have a smartphone that sleep with it is around 85%. Um, wow. and you know why, cause they use it for their alarm clock, right? You know, that's why they have it beside them in bed. Um, but of course that's going to affect their sleep because, you know, there's a lot of attention grabbing stuff on the other side of your iPhone. And so it's going to affect your sleep, not to even mention the blue light and things like that. Um, we also know that technology is affecting our social connection. You know, how often have you like not stopped to talk to someone in the office just because you were like checking your email? You know, I experienced this too. You know, I live on campus with students, as I was mentioning, and we have this lovely courtyard that you walk through. And anytime you walk through the courtyard, there'll be, you know, students in my community who I'd love to like have a two second check in with. But sometimes when I'm rushing across the courtyard, I have my phone out and I'm checking my email. And I just like, 
you know, honestly, just don't notice the students that are there. Definitely don't do the stop and chat with them, right? And so I think the ease with which we have these distractions on our phone means that we have less social connection than we could, you know, or think about the last time you were out to dinner with a friend or your partner, right? You know, and somebody had the phone out, like, you know, that's stealing our attention. It's like breaking the depth of our, the connection we feel with that person. And there's some lovely research coming out about this. Um, a professor at the University of British Columbia, Liz Dunn, has been studying the social effects of phones. Again, not just like being on social media or something like that, but literally just having your phone out. And what she finds is that people who have access to their phones, say in a waiting room or in some situation where you could be social, they smile at people 30% less than if they didn't have their phones with them. And, Mm. you know, that simple act of just smiling and connecting with people, you know, that's part and parcel of like a lot of the social kind of connection that we have that's really increasing our happiness. And so if you multiply, you know, that 30% less smiling by everyone in the world who has a smartphone in their pocket, that's paying a little less attention to their partners or a little less attention to being mindful when they're in certain situations, like when they're eating food and so on, you know, these things I think are are not helping us. Um, Again, so there's like, there's not great causal evidence about it, but the correlation is striking. Even if you just look at individual behaviors, there's definitely things we could do with our smartphones to improve our well-being, but a lot of time we're not doing those things. A lot of time we're using them in ways that just statistically should be reducing our well-being. I have three kids, eighth grader, sixth grader, fifth grader. We let our daughter buy her phone in the seventh grade, so it's been about eight months now, and I've hated it. <laughs> I've yeah. hated it. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I know that it's real, and I do feel like this is this guinea pig generation, you know, that mm-hmm. it's like we're going to be start now there is research now there are people that are researching this and they are i believe going to start revealing and showing correlations if you could take us like 10 years from now um what do you think are some of those i, I don't know i this acting asking you probably something impossible but in light of some of the research that's coming out, what are some of those activities and things that we can do that in that correlates with our iPhone that you think will increase our happiness? Like what do you like the conversations that you think are going to be a little bit more prevalent? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I think a couple things there. I mean, I think, again, you know, a smartphone is just a tool. We can use it for positive things and we can use it for not so positive things. What you know, what are the ways we can use our phones? In, in terms of a positive effect on our well-being. Well, one is to use them for social connection. You know, it's funny that an iPhone is called a phone because if I look at, you know, how often I actually use it as a real phone, you know, to like pick up, like talk to someone in real time on the phone, that happens way less than like me checking my email or me reading some blog or me, you know, doing whatever, right? And so I think like using phones in the way, in some ways they were intended, which is like to actually make a real connection can be helpful. Then I think using them for all the practices, you know, that we've just talked about, you know, taking time off, you know, use your GCAL to schedule some time off, um, or, or do you use a, one of these many apps that allow you to engage with something mindfully, you know, these sort of mindful meditation apps or gratitude app, another great technique, um, thinking about the things you're grateful for, you know, getting back to the things we were talking about with social comparison before. Um, so I think there's lots of ways that we can use our phones positively. I think another thing that will happen in the next few years is that I, I hope we're going to develop better norms about how we use our phones. And I think that's one of the problems now is that they've kind of just infiltrated all aspects of our life because, you know, they're really addictive. You know, there's fun stuff on the other side of our phone. But I think as we study more and more about the effects of these things, we might get better norms. Like, you know, when you come into a restaurant, there's a spot that you check your phone. You know, just like you put a cigarette out when you walk inside, you know, we might get to a point where like, no, normatively, you should be like, you know, putting your phone away. Um, when we engage with certain situations. And I think more and more that that's going to happen. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic more even because it's starting to feel like even cell phone companies and apps are realizing this and trying to help us get off our phones more and more. Um, you know, so for example, like the latest iPhones will actually tell you how much time you spent on your phone. You know, you get that like hint about your screen time. And I don't think anybody's ever looked at that and said, oh, I should be on my phone much more often. Like basically everyone looks at that and says, this is terrible. You know, I'm going to talk to my kids more and so on. So I think, I think apps and cell phone companies, you know, they don't want to be cigarette companies. They don't want to get regulated from outside. And I think they're going to try to help us do a little bit better in terms of our norms with our phones. That is so interesting. Uh, I am so excited to, yeah, for the social norms around how we use our phones to begin to change and for it to be a cultural shift. Uh, 
which I have a lot of hope that that can happen. Uh, well, it's also worth noting that we can start that shift ourselves too. Yes. You know, we all have our own like little mini cultures. You know, you talked about your family, you know, now your kids are getting old enough to have phones. Like, what are your family rules about phones, right? Like, you know, do they put them away, you know, at dinner? Like, you know, can do like, where do you put them? You know, do you shut them off and put them out of sight when you're having a conversation with a family member or a sibling? You know, are there time limit rules? You know, do they go off at 8 p.m.? Like, you know, it would be great for a whole culture to kind of figure this out, but we can do that locally in our families, in our business organizations, in our relationships, in our friendships. You know, you can set ground rules with friends, you know, before you go out to a dinner with a friend, you say, okay, ground rule for phones. They have to stay in the bag, you know, like, you know, this is when they come out. Like, you know, we can do that. And even though it takes a little bit of work, the research suggests that we can really have a, a huge benefit to our well being just because not having those phones around will make us a lot more mindful in all those situations. Well, it's funny that you brought up the barista because this morning I was getting coffee and I had just posted a meaningful post on Instagram. It was a little vulnerable. I knew it would be helpful to people. So I was like scrolling through the comments, you know, double, you know, giving people taps that were commenting and I'm ordering my coffee and the barista was like, so how's your morning been? And just kind of interrupted that situation of me being on my phone, having human interaction, which I say I don't like or do. And here I was doing it. And I was like, oh, my morning's been great. Great. And she's like, what are you going to do today? I'm like, well, actually later on, I'm going to take my daughter and her friends to go see a, a movie tonight, Frozen. And she's like, I love Frozen. I just took my sister to see that. And I had the most human interaction with the barista and it did start my day off in a really happy way where I, where I had a connection, you know, and it was just another note to me Ugh, to put my stupid phone away when I'm checking out at the grocery store or wherever it might be. There's just so many, uh, but it requires a certain amount of intention and almost like a contract with yourself. We're, we're, we're going to be sitting down with our daughter. We actually have quite a bit of rules, but we're, we're needing a check-in kind of that six month. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. how's our That's cell phone good. hygiene going? Um, but it almost, it just requires a commitment you know, cause they're, they are, they're just ever present. I love the way you said it, which was that, you know, you're in the middle of this Instagram kind of binge where you're looking at stuff and all of a sudden you're interrupted with someone's like, how's your morning? You're like, huh? What? Like you probably didn't even realize, you know, like, oh my gosh, there's a barista there. I could talk to that person. Right. Like right. we don't notice what we don't notice. And our phones are so attention grabbing in some ways we don't know what we're missing. Um, a lot of times I hear from parents, uh, you know, who, who have heard the podcast and have heard some of the stuff about technology and stuff. And they'll write to me kind of, you know, saying that they tried to talk to their kids about it and their kids are like, mom, well, that's you, you know, do you know all the times I'm trying to get your attention and I can't talk to you because you're like paying attention to your phone. And I think we realize this a little bit, but again, we don't notice what we don't notice. And so you're not noticing all the missed opportunities that are going by. And so again, I think you said it, perfectly, right? We just need some intention, right? We need some rules ahead of time. And we need to kind of have a revisit, like, you know, like, like two months in, like, okay, how's this going? Like, where, when have I been good about this? Where have I messed up? How can I do a little bit better? Um, you know, they're wonderful devices and they help us in so many ways. But if we could get some more of the benefits without less of the costs, you know, I think we'd all be happier as a society. I think we need some guides too. You know, when I think about health and wellness, it's like you have guides, like fitness gurus that you might follow or, you know, keto if you're, you know, needing yeah. to lose a little weight or whatever. It's, it's, I, I could see that happening in the next few years too is, is, oh, I, I'm on the, this tech diet or something, yeah. you know? Well, what's really telling is, you know, if you look at the people who create this stuff, you know, Steve Jobs did not give his kids phones, right? You know, a lot of these people who are creating these technologies themselves try to avoid it. You know, it's, it, it feels insidiously like a lot of the people who are like creating the processed food are like, oh, no, no, my wife and I never eat that stuff, right? And so that's a little telling that they know the potential problems with this stuff, you know. But I agree. I think, you know, we're going to need more hints about it's what's called attentional hygiene, this idea that, you know, we're, we're kind of regulating where our attention is going because otherwise there's lots of forces that are just totally ready to grab it out there. And unless we work hard to make sure we're directing it in the ways we want to, you know, we could be getting a real cost that we don't mm. realize. So good. So good. Okay. We are airing this episode in 2020 and I like to ask all of my guests, how are you going scared right now? 
Um, well, you know, I think uh, for me, it's like really trying to find ways to overcome the sorts of things that are scary to me. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're starting our second season of my podcast, uh, which already just doing a podcast as like a nerdy academic was kind of a scary thing. Um, but I think jumping into season two, where I think we're going to be pushing the mold a little bit and, and really getting into some controversial issues. And so I'm looking forward to that, but it's making me a little scared. Um, I'm also now recovering from an injury. I slipped on the ice and hurt my knee very badly. Um, and so I think going into 2020, I have a lot of like physical therapy and sort of like health recovery ahead of me that I'm not looking forward to. Um, but I'm trying to kind of embrace that with acceptance and intention um, and sort of look at it as a journey in the spot where I can grow more. So, so those are my 2020 uh, going scared tips. Going scared tips. The Happiness Lab with Dr. Lori Santos. It is so, so good. And it's funny because you don't come off as a nerdy academic. I mean, I just, you know, you're, you're so approachable and all the stories are so relatable. And then the research is all so interesting. And I think especially I have a lot of moms who listen to this podcast, a lot of entrepreneurs, and it's, we're raising little, little ones, like the ones that are eventually end up at Yale and we're where you're seeing, oh my gosh, these kids are anxious and overachievers. And, you know, we kind of want to stop that cycle, you know, really, we want to stop it now. And so I think a lot of the tips that you give and the research that you show is really helpful for people parenting. No, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, it's hard to apply to ourselves sometimes, but we definitely worry a lot about the well-being of our kids. And, you know, the science gives us tips, you know, as moms, what we face is a struggle where, we have the wrong intuitions just because our minds are wrong, right? Like everyone has the wrong intuitions, but that means your intuitions about parenting might be wrong too. And so I think it's all the more important to learn about the science so you can figure out, okay, what are the best practices? How should I do this right? Um, to sort of make sure that, you know, again, the kinds of mental health problems that I'm seeing in my students, you know, you know, some of that's deeply genetic, some of that's out of our control, but some of that, you know, we can fix up if we have the right healthier practices. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Going Scared podcast with Jessica Honiger. I am counting down the days for the next season of the next happiness podcast to release. You can check out Dr. Lori Santos' recent work that is the teen happiness course at coursera.org. That's coursera.org. Thanks for joining us on the Going Scared podcast. Tune in next week as we move on to our number seven listener favorite. I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.